Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone today to our first part of a three-part webinar series entitled Deep Row Entrenchment of Biosolids Using Hybrid Poplar. As I said, this is a three-part series. I'd like to welcome you. My name is Andrew Kling. I'm with the University of Maryland Extension Woodland Stewardship Education Program. And today is the first part entitled, Why Am I Here? What You Need to Know About Deep Row Entrenchment, DRE, of Biosolids Using Hybrid Poplar. The second part is next Wednesday, nuts and bolts of the DRE technique, importance of getting it done right. And then it wraps up on October 27th with protection of water quality and monitoring options for DRE. But before I turn things over to our speakers, we have a little bit of housekeeping to talk about. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and the series will be available through our website if you wanna share it with other people. If you visit our website at go.umd.edu, slash Woodland, that's our homepage. You'll scroll down to the webinars and videos page and you'll find the series there. Once everything's finished, we'll get the recordings up there for everyone to see and you can share it with whoever you wish. Now, when people come into our University of Maryland Zoom webinars, everyone's come into the waiting room. You, you uh, recognize that. And as you come in, you're muted and your video is turned off. And we'd ask you to please keep it that way because that's best for everyone involved. All the participants will have a good experience if we can keep it that way. But there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments. And we encourage you to certainly ask as many things as you can come up with. And the best way to do that is through the chat room. When you, if you're new to Zoom, uh, it's the little feature down at the center of your screen, a uh, little, comic book dialogue bubble. Uh, if you click on that, it brings up another little box and you can type in your questions and comments there. If you're not new to Zoom, which most of us aren't anymore, you know exactly where it is. So I'm just repeating myself, but go ahead and add those as you think of them. And what we'll do is we'll take the questions and the comments at the end of the presentation. We usually reserve that last 30 minute block from three to 3.30 for questions and comments. If I've if anybody has uh, things they'd like to discuss, that, that'll be the time to do it. Now, our speakers today are Jonathan Kays and Gary Felton from the University of Maryland Extension. I'd like to tell you a little bit about both of them. Jonathan is a University of Maryland Extension state forestry specialist with responsibility for programs in the areas of woodland stewardship, deer damage, natural resource income opportunities, wood energy, and biosolids and trees. His research and extension work with deep row entrenchment of biosolids extends back to 1998 and includes working at the gravel spoil site in Southern Maryland where the technique was developed by ERCO Incorporated, as well as visiting deep row entrenchment sites in Pennsylvania and Columbus, Ohio. Now, Gary Felton is director of extension for the environmental science and technology department at the University of Maryland. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in agricultural engineering from the University of Maryland and his PhD in agricultural engineering from Texas A&M. He has been working in non-point source pollution focusing on nutrients since 1978 and he's worked in biosolids since 2005. His job has included working on composting since 2004 and has been teaching and organizing the Mid-Atlantic Better Composting School since that time. He's been an instructor and an organizer for some US Composting Council compost operators training courses. He organizes and teaches large animal composting short courses and poultry mortality composting short courses in Maryland and works with the Back River Biosolids composting operation in Baltimore. Gary has served as the extension water quality specialist at the University of Maryland and works on poultry litter management, biosolids and urban nutrients. He's taught master gardeners homeowner turf grass care and management since 1997, and has researched the fate and transport of nitrogen from suburban settings as part of that work. He is chair of the Urban Nutrient Management Work Group, which is an advisory group to the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and he's the author of the Maryland Professional Lawn Care Guide. Now, Jonathan's going to go first today. So, Jonathan, you're all set to go? I am. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen. I'll turn things over to you mute my microphone and turn off my video. Okay. All right, welcome. Um, so we're here today to talk about deep row entrenchment, which is something I've 
Gary, I've been working on for a long time. Uh, and you can see kind of the site that we're going to be talking about today where a lot of the research and we took uh, took place that we did with the, the operational uh, business at IRCA, an old gravel spoil on the left and what it looked like afterwards. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about really with for a lot of this on to do this webinar was that we, a lot of these work that we've been doing for the last 10, 15, 20 years uh, to put together into a best practices um, publication. That's what we did. And that's accessed uh, through the, um, the link was on the, uh, when you register it as well, it's on our website as well. So we'll be pulling information from there, but there's um, a lot of detail in there uh, that I think you might find useful. Um, so why the interest in biosolids? Well, um, because there's a lot of them around. This is an old picture actually from Blue Plains in Washington, D.C. It looks very different, I think, now. But the point is that in large metropolitan areas, there's a lot of biosolids. And the, the challenge becomes, you know, how to utilize them, especially in a beneficial way. Um, in Maryland in particular, and I realize some of these numbers uh, are a little old at this point, but uh, what we see in Maryland is the utilization of biosolids 60% of it, this is 2014. I'm not sure how much has changed. I know they're trying to uh, you know, turn more of this into a marketable product, but still a lot of it is hauled out of state and into Virginia, up into PA and uh, parts of Maryland. So uh, of course this is, requires a lot of resources to do that. And uh, are there other options uh, that might be closer to where these uh, materials are um, produced? Um, so when we think about a beneficial reuse system, uh, of course, being a forester, I think about how to use a you know, sustainable tree farming. Um, and uh, you know, the characteristics I think of an ideal system would have these things you see here. Ideally, we don't want any odor. odor. And with a lot of applications of the forest land, typically it's surface application. And there is the whole issue of odor there as well as it is um, in spreading on farmland. You know, low energy inputs. You know, using the biological system and nutrient capture of trees uh, to basically uh, recycle the nutrients. And doesn't require a lot of land. And uh, that can become a challenge because of the application rates on farmland and other things does require a lot of land. And the land is not nearby the production site then it has to be trucked there. Uh, should have some regional application and ideally close to the production source to reduce um, transportation issues. and. Um, in this case, uh, we were focused on, you know, a lot of exhausted surface mines. And if we could provide a beneficial use for those, that was a, certainly a desirable characteristic. Well, in, in real basic context, you know, what is the deep row entrenchment system? And we're going to get into more of the specifics later, but this is just a general diagram. It's basically your know, biosolids that are interned under the ground with overburden and utilizing nutrient demanding trees that utilize the biosolids. So being enclosed underground in aerobic environment, uh, a lot of things happen very differently than happen when it's on the surface. Um, in terms of the deep row, I think this technique addresses a lot of the things we've talked about. Being underground, you, know, you don't have the odor issues. Uh, and Gary will talk about the uh, phosphorus issues and things like that. Uh, but you have the capability to restore disturbed lands and it requires a lot less, um, less land as well. And the opportunity to produce wood and other environmental benefits like wildlife, especially on old surface mines where, uh, you know, basically as a friend of mine said, in many cases a crow would have to bring a bag lunch, you know, to, to get across there. So um, it, those, are, those are real positives of this technique. The DPRO application uh, technique was actually developed by Urco Incorporated uh, in a very innovative way on a site down in Southern Maryland that you see here. I think you can see my, my cursor. It's just down not far from where I am right now, actually down Prince George's, Southern Prince George's County. And you can see that it's a six county metro area and there are a number of treatment plants that lie around here. So uh, that was, the, that was the, uh, the location, very aptly placed. And there's a lot of these old surface mines down here that can be utilized. Uh, for this on this whole ge geological area. So the questions we want to talk about today, you know, are how does a deep road technique work? You know, what have we learned from the research we've done? You know, what happens to the biosolids? What happens to the water? How about the trees? You know, a lot of questions I think people have 
that aren't familiar with this. So um, at this point, I am going to um, switch over, uh, exit, stop sharing, and switch over to Gary and let him uh, take over uh, for the next part of the program, and then I'll come back when he's done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, nutrient fate and transport, not in great detail, some odor. We're going to look at some of the properties of DRE and the benefits and talk a little bit about the special case of coal mine reclamation. And then we'll introduce the project that we worked on. So when we look at the impact of P-based nutrient management on surface application, and this doesn't have to be mines, this is surface application period. The organic amendments almost always contain phosphorus, whereas fertilizer doesn't have to have phosphorus. Most forms of organic amendments contain more phosphorus relative to, nit to nitrogen than the plant needs, which means if we put enough organic amendment on to make the nitrogen needs satisfied, then we're applying too much phosphorus. So the result is either we're exceeding the phosphorus needs or we have to supplement with N applications. So when we do an N application in conventional some form of agriculture, we, we apply three to six tons per acre. That doesn't seem like a lot, you know, three to six tons is a lot of weight, but when you spread it over an acre, it's not a whole lot. But if it's a P-based application, that might be as low as a half a ton per acre. So we have land application rates for agriculture. We have competition for available land for surface application. And we have political realities with states and counties. And all of these tend to restrict the amount of land available for biosolids beneficial reuse. So let's look a little more at nitrogen and phosphorus. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. If we look at some amendments, compost has a nitrogen to phosphorus ratio much better than I ever thought it would be. It was about 2.6, and this is just mass to mass. Biosolids is about 2.1, and manure is really low at 1.04. I believe this was dairy manure. And these are general values. It's just tests of, test samples. Plant needs are different. For instance, for corn, the nitrogen N to P ratio should be about 5 to 1. So we have a very different plant need N to P ratio compared to what we get out of the organic amendments. If we apply phosphorus, well, the phosphorus stays around. The N doesn't because soils kind of like phosphorus. The reason is that clay has a negative charge, phosphorus has a positive charge, and the clays tend to latch on to phosphorus, bind it to the soil. So if you're doing nitrogen applications every year with organic amendments, the phosphorus that you added last year is probably still there in some form. So in other words, P stays. If you're doing surface applications, N goes to one of numerous places. It could go to volatilization, to leaching, to crop yields, and to the nitrogen cycle. If we use DRE, we cut out volatilization completely, hopefully re tremendously reduce leaching, and therefore we get to put nitrogen into either the crop yield or the nitrogen cycle. So that's one of the advantages of DRE. Um, basically, DRE has almost no impact on the phosphorus-based nutrient management because it all goes underground. Any phosphorus that leaves that trench doesn't get very far because it gets um, taken up by a clay particle that's nearby. Oh, the other thing is the P content of the spoil that we're putting it in is really, really low. So there's lots of places for the phosphorus to attach. Moving on to odor problems, we kind of look at surface applications versus DRE. If any of you were driving up I-95 a few years ago and came close to Laurel, the odor problem from some surface applications was pretty obvious. Uh, there were traffic jams because it stunk so bad. People were just looking around everywhere instead of driving. Odor applications get places shut down really quick. The basic problem is that in almost all manures, hydrogen sulfide gets produced and that's that rotten egg smell. 
In DRE, the biosolids are buried with an hour of delivery and get a daily cover when the trench is not filled. So they're buried so quickly that the odor really doesn't get around. Okay, what is DRE, DPRO application? It's that beneficial reuse system that gives us no odor, low energy, small land acreage, high application rate. That's kind of important with the amount of biosolids we have. It's close to the production sources. It can be reclaimed. It can be used to reclaim surface mine lands. There's an asterisk behind beside that because we got to talk a little bit about that. It can't always be used. There are some caveats. One of the caveats is broken rock coal spoil. Um, in broken rock coal spoil, we're going to have some leaching, and I'll talk about why in a minute. You have to ask yourself or somebody that's in a re um, regulatory role, are the environmental improvements we're going to get, and those are provided by DRE, is that a reasonable trade-off for some nitrogen leaching? Um, when the pH of the water is 2, that might seem like a reasonable trade-off. So what are our project goals? This is a project, not a research goal. These are project goals. We want to know if a product can be produced. We want to know what level of tipping fee is needed to be able to make DRE profitable. Can losses to the environment be minimized? Um, I never say that losses are eliminated. I always say minimized. Are there necessary spoil conditions to make DRE work? And if so, what are those? In other words, what do I need to look at to make sure I don't put it in a poor location? And another project goal is to educate state and local environmental professionals about the use of DRE, which is something we just might be trying to do today. Hello. There we go. Uh, go back one. Specific research questions. We would like to determine the effects of tree density and biosolids application rate on water quality around deep rows. So we have those two factors, tree density and biosolids application rate. We want to look at the effect of tree density and biosolid application rate on the above ground growth, the biomass production, and the survival of hybrid poplar. We want to look at the economic feasibility of DRE at different plant densities and application rates, as well as the value of the environmental benefits, which is kind of hard to quantify. And we want to quantify the fate of and transport of nitrogen and phosphorus. The research design is a randomized block design, three tree densities, three biosolids application rates. Picture is here, the details are here. I don't want to go over it, except that we have a lot of nitrogen going down. I, I put down normally about 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre for corn, and we're talking about 4,000 to 8,000 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's a lot of nitrogen. And there's some reasons for that. Okay. <clears throat> what about the application rate for different tree densities? This is a three acre research site. So we've broken it down into a fairly small area. And we have trees at 0, 290, and 430 trees per acre. And we have application rates of 4, 8, and 12,000. Uh, wet tons of biosolids per acre. The dry tons are over at the right-hand column. In terms of putting it in a trench, the trench is 42 inches wide. So it's 12 and a half inches for the lowest application rate. It's 37 and a half inches for the highest application rate. And so the total depth of the deep row is 24 inches for the low rate, all the way down to 49 inches for the high rate. The research design includes data collection in which we use pan lysimeters, suction lysimeters, observation standpipes, and sampling wells. The sampling wells are already required by our various permits, so we're using them to collect extra data. The parameters that we're analyzing the water for is total nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, 
It's really nitrate plus nitrite, but there's almost no nitrite in it. NH3 or ammonia nitrogen, total phosphorus, and the pH. There's other parameters, but these are the major ones. So this is a monitoring well. These are collected periodically by an independent sampling company. So we don't get to touch them, which is fine with us. This is a pan lysimeter schematic. This is at the bottom here. The pan lysimeter is made out of stainless steel. It's a triangle, so it collects water that runs from the bottom of the trench into the pan, and then we have a pipe to collect it through. Uh, we had ranges, the, the lysimeters themselves were 30 centimeters or 12 inches below the bottom of the pan. So if you remember, the bottom of the trench was different for different application rates. So the depth of the pan lysimeter was different, but the distance between the biosolids and the pan was always the same. We have wells and standpipes. These were just put in to look at the biosolids pack itself. It was screened into the backfill, but not all the way up to the surface. And mainly it was meant to collect the biosolids water standing. And basically we used just a float to measure how much water was standing in the pipe. After two years, we didn't find any water standing in these standpipes, even after uh, rain events. So at this point, I'm going to quit sharing, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jonathan. So um, thanks, Gary. That was kind of an overlay of the uh, of the research, and we'll you know provide more details on that later. But the question becomes, you know, what prompted this whole development of deep row entrenchment? I think, and then again, this was a technique created by Erco uh, Incorporated, and uh, uh, Paul Fonino, I know, and, and Eric and, and Scott and others involved. Um, Basically, came as a result, I think, of the Clean Water Act, where biosolids can no longer be put out in barges in the ocean, and uh, the idea of beneficial utilization came about. And uh, there was some re there is some work from some early work that was done, not here, um, but was done uh, in other, not that far away, where they actually buried the uh, you know the biosolids, but they really didn't have any vegetation material of enough quality to really take it up, and it was too deep and I think something was learned from that, uh, the need to make the, uh, uh, the, the, the trenches are basically shallow enough that they're within the rooting zone of the vegetation, in this case, the trees. So uh, again, I think it's, it's important to mention that um, you know, Urco created this technique uh, and, and innovated it. And the, and the whole site was a place for innovation. And we basically came in um, well after it was established. Um, this is the site itself. Uh, it was about uh, you know over 100 acres, um, and 110 or 120 acres, but 10 uh, basically these 10 acre sections, and each of these were established on their own. Then they were went through a process and uh, uh, basically were treated as a standard unit. And you can see the seven monitoring wells are these little red things that are located around the edges, and you can see where our three acre research plot was was essentially over here. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of where it was located. So the point that is the important thing to mention is this, this was inserted into an existing operational farm. Uh, this was not a research site. We put a research site into an operational farm and um, Erco was uh, very, made that possible. Uh, the, the basic DRE process is this, being, being a, uh, putting a shallow, wide trench it was about 40 inches by 30 inches um, with a backhoe like this, bringing in the biosolids on a truck. These are pretty much all lime stabilized early on when they did this, uh, which started in the early 80s. Um, they uh, had to mix the lime in there, I believe, but it came from the uh, treatment facility while we were working there, certainly lime stabilized. Right next to the trench, you can see it um, you know, volatilizing there. And with a, um, a bulldozer then pushing it in and uh, covering it up. And so basically it goes, you know, there's no oxygen, it's not getting oxygen. It's, it's going total anaerobic, um, which is what Gary said, there's no real uh, odors and uh, things like that. And of course, all the things that will happen uh, as a result. The, um, 
it looks kind of like this, kind of like a moonscape after it's all applied, because you do one row, then pile it up on top of the other, and then you do the next row and pile it up. And prior to planting in the spring, which is where all the planting is done, you can see the site is leveled. And um, as you see here, and trying to establish kind of a equal overburden that ranged from, oh, it just depended on the particular site, but trying to keep the overburden um, you know, at, at a certain a certain level. And coming through after it was you know, graded in the spring with a, uh, a tractor and setting up a grid, basically using a, uh, a ripper, ripper bar and going across the field such that where the rippers intersected at 10 foot intervals when we were doing it, uh, they, they, we basically planted a stacking like you see here, these cuttings uh, such as they are. The trees, this was, uh, this was when they were planting a lot more trees per acre uh, than when we got, after we got involved, but six months and these trees uh, at six years, that's uh, actually uh, Eric Flamino who uh, ran the manager of the farm there. Um, and you can see uh, these trees are doing quite well and they're basically feeding off the, uh, the biosolids and actually the, the ground where the trenches are start to sink as it utilizes the biosolids and the moisture. So you start to get a little bit more un uneven ground again. Uh, parameters for reapplication as established in the initial research permit in the Maryland Department of Environment uh, in the early, in the eighties, uh, basically took regular field samples of the biosolids and we take a sample. And once the deep rows showed about 70% mineralization of the biosolids, and the reason they're getting mineralized is because the tree roots are utilizing uh, the biosolids. Then the site can be reapplied as well as the, the foliar leaf samples show uh, less than three and a half percent nitrogen. Uh, and the poplars, of course, can go a lot higher than that. But felt when it gets, they felt that once it gets down to that level, um, the trees are starting to need more nitrogen, basically. They're getting a little bit more starved. So um, those are the two parameters for reapplication. And when that was met, uh, the site was harvested and the stumps removed, uh, the site was graded and would be reapplied perpendicular to the existing uh, network of, of trenches. Um, and we'll get into the, uh, the aspect of um, uh, how the material is utilized, but in many cases um, it was used for um, chips and things like that. These trees, in many cases, did not get that big. Um, so the question is, you know, why did the University of Maryland get involved in this? Um, and these pictures are actually from the very early days uh, prior to when we were involved and they were starting. And well, there was a lot of concern. Actually, they won, Berko won a number of awards from the local soil conservation um, and things like that. But there was still a lot of concern about the high application rates and um, whether there was leaching into the, in the ground table, even though None of, none of the water quality assessments showed that. There was also a lack of understanding of nutrient dynamics with biosolids and trees. I, I think a lot of folks um, you know, who were involved with the regulatory side didn't really understand how trees utilize uh, and, and grow, uh, utilize the material. So that, um, along with a couple other things, the university was brought in that early 90s. I came in a little bit later than that, in the late 90s. Um, to try and you know, come up with a project that could actually verify and uh, substantiate that the, there wasn't a lot of weeds. And I think water quality was definitely the main concern that brought this on. So uh, some of the changes that were made once I started came into the project and Gary as well, about 1998, uh, was to reduce the density of trees. Initially, they were planting trees like 2,722 trees per acre. And as a forester, I realized that by planting fewer trees, and from what I've read, you're going to basically get a very similar amount of um, uh, get the same, same uptake. The biomass is going to be put in fewer trees. And that's more desirable because then you get trees that are going to be a larger size and they can be more easily utilized and harvested for products of another kind, a number of different kinds. So that's where, um, uh, that's where that came from. The other change that was made, initially using a clone called HP308, uh, we did a clonal study, which I'll talk about one of the other um, one of the other uh, later webinars. But 
we found there was a lot of problems with the HP 308, especially with canker uh, on the trees and uh, basically caused a lot of damage and the tops would break. But we found OP367 to be a much better clone, much grew much faster and we really didn't have much problems with uh, insects and disease. Um, the, the leaf beetle either, cotton leaf beetle. So uh, that worked out quite well. And I think a lot of other places are using it as well. Uh, so the question is why use hybrid poplar? You know, we just, we just focus on, you know, um, native species. Why aren't we using a native species, you know? Well, the fact is that most native species really just don't take up that much nitrogen. You know, thing like well, many of your pines, uh, like wild pine and other things, they can exist on, you know, 20 pounds of nitrogen take up you know, 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, per year. And, um, uh, you know, even your better, higher quality hardwoods like walnut and poplar, you know, 100, 150, somewhere in there. So we're talking about hybrid poplar, which are, you know, um, basically uh, you know, clones and combinations of, of different cottonwood species uh, capable of uptake of 200 to 360 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And certainly been involved with others doing this that indicate the uptake could be even more. It's, it's kind of like an open faucet. You know, it can just uses a lot of nitrogen, takes up a lot of water, and it can take up a lot of nitrogen in that water. Uh, there's also high root turnover, about 30 days or so, that sequesters a lot of carbon. Uh, and uh, different clonal varieties from crosses of, of native species. And uh, I think I hear someone in the background. Uh, clicking and stuff. I'm not sure uh, where that's coming from. So maybe everybody could mute their, um, uh, mute their microphone. So different clonal varieties, and that's why we did a clonal trial. Actually, one of the recommendations is, you know, you should be doing that. To make sure that's the best one for the site. Uh, the poplar itself is a proven one for pulp. Pacific Northwest has been working with the hybrid poplar for years and um, capable of producing larger diameter trees as well. So again, a lot of what we were able to implement on the site was implemented and, and it was the reason for the initial choice of Ira Popo, I would, I would think, was because of all the silvicultural systems that's been used on in British Columbia and Seattle. Uh, Seattle and Tacoma uh, land apply most of their biosolids in native um, forest out east of Seattle um, on the surface. So uh, there was a lot to learn from, and uh, as well as uh, with mine reclamation, and there are a number of companies out there that do that. Uh, uh, Silvis uh, out of British Columbia was extremely helpful in what we did and learned a lot from the practices they've used up in, um, in British Columbia. So a couple of the conclusions that came out of the study, we'll you know, go into more detail on these later, um, but you know, for the Basically for the first three years, uh, pretty much zero nitrate left in deep row tree system. Uh, now, there was a, a lot of ammonia that came, it was immediately released into the soil nearby the biosolids, but those concentrations themselves uh, decreased dramatically as you got away from the biosolids trench. Uh, as you can see falling here from 21 milligrams of nitrogen per liter at six inches or 15 centimeters to you know, 400 at 60 centimeters. And I think we had, Gary will probably share the results of some of his work uh, when he does the third seminar uh, about some ones that are even further away. So th the take home message of this is that overall, what we found uh, from, this, from, the, from the project was that nitrate concentra concentrations are pretty much lower than those found beneath corn crops while utilizing a, a very, high application of nitrogen, uh, as was mentioned. So I think it, it proved that basically this technique worked and uh, there wasn't serious water quality implications, at least on the sites that we were working on, which were old, old gravel, old gravel spoils. Um, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the biomass side of it, the tree side of it, uh, we had some real issues there. And, what we had is that whole site around the area around there was being developed as we were doing this work. And we had a lot of deer browsing. And they first started this project in the 80s, um, this business. Uh, they didn't have the deer populations. Uh, but what we found is that deer browsing was extremely heavy. They were browsing off the tops of these. 
Um, also, um, the site preparation I mentioned with the, um, um, the ripper, which was done on the operational sites, could not be done on the research sites because of all the instrumentation that was being put in. So that was a real, a real issue. You didn't get the soil broken up. And we just uh, also had, on top of that, drought. So uh, the result of this is that if you look at this table, it shows you that the, the operational area of the tree farm that you see here, um, and 1999 to 2005, this is you know where they've been operating before. These were trees that were planted, um, you know, back in the uh, early 90s. In many cases, uh, a little bit later, um, had a dry biomass content of 14.9, height of 8.4 8 meters. Um, but when we looked at our research plots, we just had large areas that were devoid. The trees all died, uh, and for those that we did get very very low total height, very little biomass. And again, that was because of the challenge of site preparation, as well as the deer browsing, which is the take home, one of the take home messages here is that that needs to be consideration in establishing a site like this, uh, is making sure you have protection from deer, um, making sure you do proper site preparation and making um, arrangements for irrigation, uh, at least in that first year, uh, which is so critical. So conclusions for growth and, and survival is that um, clone selection and site access is very important. Uh, being able to get equipment in and using the right clone. Pipe, proper site preparation, use of herbicides and planting early is essential. Uh, that first year is the first, you, if you can't get a plant in the first year, you can have a lot of problems. Uh, that's, that's the take home message there. Uh, the composition of the overburden affects the growth and survival because it's extremely variable in many cases. And first year irrigation should be available if it's needed um, because of the extreme growing conditions that can result. Uh, protection from deer using fencing. I mean, if that's the case, you just need to consider that a cost of doing business. Uh, um, and we, a lot of people are using tree shelters now here for trees. Well, we found they really didn't work. It was so hot and dry on these sites that it just kind of cooked the trees. So um, we didn't find that as satisfactory. And phosphorus and iron amendments may be beneficial. And uh, it depends on the foliar analysis. Uh, we also did an economic analysis as best we could, um, looking at the existing enterprise that was there. And Urko was kind enough to, to give us those numbers to do that. Um, and, and, and what basically, there is a fact sheet in, uh, on our website about this. Um, the profitability at the lowest application rate was very minimal. And this was assuming a tipping fee. And so of course, that's the basis of this business is the income derived from the tipping fees. But it also assumes harvesting is a cost, not a revenue year. And so if you can grow trees large enough that you can actually sell them for mulch or whatever, of course, that, that's gonna affect the, uh, uh, the results of profitability. So basically the profitability of those higher application rates, 345 to 40, 50 wet tons per acre increases dramatically. And of course, when you apply this to a larger land area, it could be a lot more profitable. Um, it is a matter of scale, especially when you're looking about keeping this heavy equipment busy that you're using. So um, uh, there's more that can be done on that for sure, um, but um, uh, it can be profitable. Um, so the question becomes here is that, you know, um, it's not really, it's not, this is, technique is not permitted in Maryland uh, the, by the Maryland Department of Environment. And, the question is why, because there's actually thousands of acres of this type of potential um, land that exists. Now, this is 1998, and you know, I, so many things, I, I never have really updated this. A lot of some of this land has been developed for sure, but a lot of these are around, uh, these old uh, spoils that were done, uh, especially before the 1977 Reclamation Act. So why not? And uh, I, all I can say is that uh, we, we provide the, this research, we work with the Maryland Department of Environment, and uh, for whatever reasons, they were unwilling to accept uh, the conclusions we had, and uh, um, uh, which would have made the, the, the enterprise uh, more possible for, uh, for the company at the site, and uh, the site has been closed down, they made a business decision on that. So we're hopeful that um, perhaps this can be re-looked at. So the question here is that, like just this is the Urco site that you see right here on the top. And as we were working here, 
there's about a 1500 acre uh, gravel spoil across the road that opened and would have been a great candidate to, uh, to try some of these techniques. Uh, but again, we were not able to get the, uh, the permits necessary uh, or to even you know, talk to the people that own that land to, uh, to make that possible. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't used elsewhere and it has been. Uh, so pretty much on a lot of coal mine spoils uh, that um, were uh, mined before the 1977 Surface Mine Reclamation and Coal Reduction Act was put in place. There's a lot of these spoils through Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Maryland. And uh, there's no, um, no push, no, no policy or anything, regulation that they have to be. So these are excellent potential sites to do deep row entrenchment uh, because you can develop an enterprise and improve the land at the same time um, and um, in utilize, beneficial utilization of the stuff, of the biosolids. And I visited a couple of these sites that are going, uh, one's a couple of anthracite coal spoils, one's in Mahoney, Pennsylvania, Wind Gap, Pennsylvania, and also I know the city of Columbus, uh, which has a number of old coal spoils around it. Uh, there are a number of projects that are ongoing around there where they're doing deep row entrenchment. And I think the important thing here is that both Gary and myself received a lot of calls about this, but in all of these cases, they've pretty much utilized the University of Maryland research. It's been submitted as a way to attain the permits uh, to, to, to get this done um, and to apply this practice in these other places. So our research is being pretty much taken and uh, applied to these other states, other sites. But uh, unfortunately at this time, uh, we can't do that in Maryland and perhaps uh, that's something that can, can change. Um, also, uh, just as a matter of interest, deep row entrenchment and is an acceptable practice by the uh, British Columbia Ministry of Environment. It's included in one of their um, land practice guides. So what does it look like? <laughs> these are very different sites. You've got all kinds of things out there, you know, heavy, big rocks and uh, all different types of, of I'll, so I'll call it soil, but overburden. But again, using deep row, they've established um, trees on a lot of these sites. And uh, this is from uh, up in Pennsylvania. This is a little different kind of material. You can see where my foot is on the lower left. Um, and, um, and then uh, another site up in, um, in Lehigh, Pennsylvania. Um, and again, you can see the, the type of material you're dealing with. It's, extremely uh, diverse from large stones to, uh, to small materials. Um, and again, you know, burying it in a deep row. So uh, in Columbus, Ohio, again, some other sites that are out there. So uh, that's what I have so far. Uh, uh, this is kind of a brief overview of the project, uh, what we, what's been, been, what we've done. I uh, tried to give you a little background on some of the the benefits of this technique. I mean, you're utilizing something in a very positive way. It's typically been a problem. You know, how do you, how do you utilize this? Um, and uh, I think it's important for me to mention that all this research, you know, this was not possible without the use of the ERCO property and the invaluable assistance of, of ERCO owners and staff, and especially Eric Fulmino, uh, Scott Fulmino, uh, who managed the site here and did the day-to-day -day work helped us make this research project possible. Uh, also a lot of thanks to Mike Van Ham of Silvis uh, Environmental up in British Columbia. Um, the knowledge that he has from all the mine reclamation and other work he's done was invaluable. Um, and helped us on a number of occasions to uh, uh, with some of the research we're doing. And the Washington, Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, it provided, uh, well, I don't know, it was probably about three quarters of a million dollars of, for funding this project, um, all total probably close to a million, but all the other sources. So um, there's a number of other partners involved, but uh, I think it's important to mention that you know, this technique was developed by a private company with a person with an idea and uh, was uh, ongoing for many, many years and is now being used in a number of applications. So in the following webinars, uh, next week, we're gonna talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of this, a little bit more, a lot more detail of all aspects of it. And then the final webinar is gonna be um, mostly Gary 
who's going to really go into the whole monitoring? I mean, one of the questions is about how do you monitor on, especially on coal spoils and, you know, and the, and the um, specifics of what was found from the research in terms of nitrogen and things like that. So I encourage everybody to hang in there for that. So at that, I will um, ask um, Andrew, uh, see if we have any questions. Yeah, we do. We have, we have a number of uh, questions awesome. and comments. Yeah, so go ahead and leave your, your, uh, your contact information up there. Okay. Uh, in case uh, people want to drop you a line outside this and with the recording as well, it'll be, it'll be valuable. So the first question is, is this hybrid popular species use restricted by current climate zones? And current is in quotation, so I'm not quite sure what Jennifer means by that, but she's up in New York. Uh, so maybe she's thinking about uh, with the potential for climate change. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of different clones of hybrid poplar that have been developed. Okay? And some of them definitely perform better in colder, colder climates and warmer climates. And I think you just would need to look uh, to so many plantings that may be in your area. or there's, But there's a vast body of research on on it, and again, my recommendation is if you're going to use a site, is at least to do a, is to look at doing a clonal uh, clonal trial with a number of different clones. And that was what one thing that Silvis uh, uh, Environmental helped us with is, you know, choosing some of those potential species and then trying them for a couple of years to see how they perform. But the answer is yes, there, you, the, the, some of the hybrid poplars clones perform better in different climates than others. But hybrid poppers would perform in New York. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're in Minnesota and, uh, um, you know, other areas. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is it only dewatered biosolids cake that can be used or can liquid sludge be used? We have not tried to use liquid sludge. Um, handling issues would be probably something we could overcome. However, when you start putting water with nutrients in it, into trenches, it makes regulators a little nervous. So I, I think that might be something that would be, I wouldn't try it because it would cause concerns. Um, sludge is usually about 75% water, whereas um, the liquid material is usually about 95%. And the difference between that is the difference between water and jello. Thank you for that, uh, that nice visual. It uh, answer, answers a question for me. I, I was wondering what the consistency was in that. Black, <laughs> ugly jello. <laughs> There's always room for jello. At least that's what they tell us. I don't know in this case. <laughs> okay, the, ne the next. Uh, Next thing is, a, is a, a comment, actually. Larger slash longer native cottonwood cuttings or actual poles may be utilized or tried in the system. Planting and stock costs need to be considered. Yeah, so that's true. In fact, you know, I didn't mention this, but, you know, higher poplar is used a lot in a lot of phytoremediation projects uh, where there's, you know, pollution from, um, uh, you know, petroleum, things like that. And I've seen cases where it actually, you know, take them way down into the ground to get that, that root system down into the uh, deep depths because the roots develop this kind of architectural system that kind of go down very, very deep and uh, will suck up. They use so much water that, so if there's contaminants down in the water table, by actually sucking up all that water, it'll actually um, you know, tie up all that material in the biomass. So it's, it's a common species for phytoremediation. Now, there's also a lot of folks in cuttings or steckings, as they're called, can get very expensive. And in fact, the person who was doing this uh, uh, on a large basis could develop like a, um, uh, you know, place and develop just their own, um, uh, grow some trees for cuttings, specifically for cuttings, and uh, just let them grow out and just cut their own, own material every year from new sprouts that come out from the stems. Uh, and that would definitely be, uh, be profitable because the way a lot of planting was done before, and this was uh, 
the work we had done it had purchased the the cuttings from a place quite far away, and they had to be overnighted. So there was a lot of high cost in, in the shipping, and then of course they had to be put in right away. So if you have the option to have kind of a, a, a seating area or a clonal area where you can produce your own, that could definitely be a part of this whole whole system, and save considerable amount of money. It would be worth an experiment to see what survival was on, you know, 12 inch steckings, 24 inch steckings and 48 inch steckings. So if someone was going to do this commercially, that might be something you want to look at. And again, if it would depend whether you're paying for those or you're producing them yourselves, I think, because yeah. I know they can get quite costly. And again, you want the right clone. So, you know, once you have a clone, you can reproduce it easily vegetatively. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there any reason why poultry waste DAF sludge or anaerobic, anaerobic digester digested can't also be used similarly? Um, the DAF is kind of a jello type of sludge, not quite. It's basically it's flotation material, and that's what the F is for. It would probably adapt quite well. It would be, have a lot of similar characteristics to our dewatered biosolids. The anaerobic digester digestate is pretty liquid. I wouldn't mind trying it. I certainly think it would be pretty good, but I don't know if it would have a high enough nutrient content to do the trees a lot of good. It might simply be another way to add water. Uh, it would be worth looking into. We have not tried it, so I can't say for sure, but I don't see an initial problem with it other than the fact that AD digestate's pretty liquid. I, I do know that, uh, Gary, went over at, at ERCO that we looked at the possibility of trying to use poultry litter as kind of a surface uh, amendment, because a lot of those trees were struggling with, you know, after a while for nitrogen and phosphorus, especially phosphorus. Uh, but again, that would require uh, permits that uh, we were on, we would be unable to get. So uh, it was just an idea, but certainly something that could be considered. I think it's something that's worth mentioning in that <laughs> we determined that after about five years, we really needed to fertilize the trees again. And found pho actually phosphorus was kind of limiting in a lot of those. Um, did a small experiment adding some phosphorus. It did help. But again, we had a couple of years of drought, so it was very hard to uh, draw out. good conclusions. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of ties into the next comment in the queue, which is establishment of poplar or cottonwood plantings is always a challenge. <laughs> Stock size and water important. Water are important for sure. So the next question is why the hang up in the Maryland Department of Agriculture or state level bureaucrats, or why is there a hang up in, in this department or is it state level bureaucrats in accepting or expanding the application of DRE? Well, it was actually the Maryland Department of Environment that uh, is a regulatory agency. And uh, I don't know, we provided the research and uh, um, which I thought was, was pretty clear, but uh, doesn't seem to be a willingness to, um, to want to move beyond, beyond forward with it. Um, uh, I don't know, Gary, you have any comments? I think right now, part of it was what we got a little frustrated and just gave up. <laughs> and at this point with a new um, head of MDE, it might be possible to convince them that it's worth taking a second look at. So I'm a little optimistic that it could be done. Yeah, in fact, you know, we've actually talked with those folks. I, I totally agree. There's a new kind of new sheriff in town, so to speak. There's a little different willing to look at some of these things. So. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, should vegetation be established between the trees, especially on steep slopes? <clears throat> So the original work that was done there, they didn't use any herbicides or any, it was just mowing. Um, and the, so there was, you know, grass cut between, and I tried to get them to do that, but, and I think that 
the use of herbicides, I think, is really something that needs to be experimented with because it would deal with a lot of the issues of um, vegetation management. Because vegetation is a real problem. Uh, and I think the use of some type of a pre-emergent uh, after planting would uh, stop any uh, other things from coming in for a while and give the, the cuttings a better chance around, you know, just around the planting area. And I do know that uh, if you can't, if you have to replant the second year, you have to remove that vegetation either mechanically or, or chemically. Otherwise, it's kind of a waste of time trying to plant a second in there. So let me jump in here. Um, whenever you have tree roots that are going down maybe 36 inches and they start sucking the water out of the biosolids, the soil above it collapses into long trenches running parallel to the tree rows. That makes mowing so difficult and so uncomfortable that it's not likely that you're going to get people to do the mowing unless you come in and try to remediate those trenches. So that's, that's a problem that has to be dealt with if we're going to mow between, and I think vegetation on steep slopes is probably a pretty good idea because there's a lot of bare soil before we get establishment. Yeah, and I agree. I, I'm just talking like around the actual, around the actual steckings themselves yeah. uh, so that they can, so they can grow and survive the first couple of years, especially but once they get their roots down in there. I think it's less of an issue, yeah. But erosion was a problem in cases, you know, so get it, you're right. Having vegetation there is, and using best management practices in terms of the way things are laid out is, uh, is important. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about ammonia. How can we establish the pounds of ammonia under the trenches versus only considering the concentration? Trudy must be from Material Matters. I think that's who I'm talking to. Um, how do we establish? We, we, can, we measured it, but that's a pretty hard trick to do. Um, it takes labor and expense in terms of having water analyzed. The amount of ammonia that's in, it's in the soil water, but it doesn't come out in the free water near as much. In our uh, t zero tension lysimeters, we got a lot less nitrogen total than we did in our suction lysimeters. And the difference is probably at least partly that the ammonia stays in the soil because ammonia, like phosphorus, has a positive charge and it will attack, it'll, it will attract to the clays and it'll stay in that matrix a lot better than nitrate will. So you will get nitrate coming out as long as there's oxygen in the soil, which doesn't occur very deep. And so some ammonia will be converted to nitrogen, but down deep in these soils, the ammonia is going to stay as ammonia and only slowly convert once the tree roots get there. We avoided this little detail of hybrid poplars, but I'm going to bring it in. <clears throat> hybrid poplars have roots, and within those roots is a structure called an arenchyma. Think of it as a tunnel to the surface that allows oxygen in. And when the roots get to a place in the soil, oxygen also gets there so that the ammonia can then convert to nitrate that the trees can take up much easier. Although the trees can also take up ammonia. But without that conversion, the ammonia is pretty well bound to the soil. So the pan lysimeter data would tell you what water is getting into the water that is free to move. And those concentrations were much lower. Basically, we highlighted the worst case scenario. I'm glad you mentioned the parenchyma, um, um, Gary, because uh, yeah, that's such a critical part of one of the attributes of hybrid poplar, you know, along with the fact they, they, they just have this very strong architectural root system that they really reaches out and uh, and all the rapid growth that takes place. So, yeah. Which is another reason why we didn't, we don't use native species. <laughs> it's a native species. It's it is a native. native. It's it just is. native to the Mississippi Valley. It's, it's a mix, you know, it's not yeah. a pure, it's a mix of different native species is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what about side dressing liquid biosolids on the surface as a supplement? I like it. Uh, permitting would be the issue because you're putting on more nitrogen, but obviously the trees need it after the next, after the first four or five years. And you might want to grow trees out to perhaps 12 to 14 inches dbh you're going to need to add extra nutrients because there's not enough left in the biosolids after five or six years to do any good for the trees so some sort of supplemental nutrient is necessary liquid biosolid waste would be good to me digestate of any sort yeah you know i didn't really mention this but most of these plant plantings lasted about six to eight years before they just ran out of juice <laughs> you know, get those minimum qualifications for foliar and uh, mineralization in the, in the biosolids back and were basically, uh, you know, harvested in, in the places we applied. So you're right, you know, anything that could be done to extend the rotation, so to speak, uh, would make sense. But then that, this is the permitting issue um, at that point. Okay, we have a two-part question having to do with regulators and, and uh, water quality. Why do regulators focus on NH3N concentrations under the trenches and compare to drinking water standards of 10 milligrams per liter? Do you consider an NH3N concentration greater than 10 milligrams per liter in lysimeter water under the trenches to be a problem? I'm going to have to answer that question in a couple of parts. Um, first, the 10 milligram per liter is nitrate nitrogen. It's a limit for nitrate. So why do they equate ammonia to nitrate? I don't know. Um, and remember, that's a drinking water standard. Uh, it doesn't say anything about other water. But equating it is just not a legitimate thing to do. The second part of the question, is it concentrations greater than 10 milligrams per liter in a lysimeter? It depends on whether it's a suction lysimeter or a zero tension lysimeter. If it's greater than 10 milligrams per liter of just nitrogen, let's just call it nitrogen, in a pan lysimeter, a zero tension lysimeter, then I'm saying there's nitrate get, nitrogen getting away that probably shouldn't. But if it's in a suction lysimeter, that really doesn't tell us much because that suction is sucking in the soil water. It's making that um, water that's got ammonia in it move to the lysimeter. So it's pulling a sample that the water would not normally move to a sampling point. So it's telling you what's in the soil matrix. That's not a great answer for the question, but that's the best answer I've got. So is the suction, um, in the suction lysimeter, is that material that might otherwise be bound to soil particles? If it had time to interact with soil particles, it could bind and become much more difficult to dislodge. Now you can always dislodge something that's bound. It just takes stronger and stronger chemicals to do it. Okay, a couple of questions following up on uh some of the earlier answers. Uh, poles are planted deep in Italy for veneer quality, but also in photoremediation applications. It gets it out of the browse zone as well. And the larger stock cutting or steckling size and or pole size gets away from the competition of the weedy layer. Grasses or rye can hold the site until the, street, until the trees establish and cl clover cover has its benefits as well while holding surface runoff. Yeah, I, I think, as I recall, Mr. May, I, I think may have been a producer. Of, so he, uh, he uh, is, yes. So he has a lot of experience. And again, you know, a lot of this is a matter of cost and amid, uh, what can be sold. Right now, I know the Pacific Northwest, you know, they've tried to develop a market, you know, uh, you know for a larger diamond of material. As far as I understand, it hasn't been real successful. So, you know, before you're going to invest in those kind of things, uh, you know, for any forest product, you need a lot of it to make it have marketable. And at least where we are, there's a lot of other things that are veneer quality that are more desirable. Um, so yeah, it's a matter just of cost and investment, I think. But uh, 
that's a, that's an interesting comment. Yeah. I'm going to put an aside on that to the economics. In part of our economic analysis, we determined that it would have taken approximately a thousand acres of this land to make a good economic return on the process that we were using. Um, we had a hundred acres and a thousand would have been required in order to get, you know, get rich. Like we'll get rich growing trees. Well, you know how you get rich by, you know how you get rich growing trees, don't you? Is you buy land with big trees on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old forestry joke. Right? Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of people who uh, thank you for the for the series. One of them said, "I'm hopeful we'll see more of this in in her region." And uh, Mr. McMahon comments that six to eight years is a half rotation for pulp in Minnesota, but a coppice slash reed sprout system would need supplemental applications of nutrients to sustain the site and tree growth. Absolutely. He says, I worked with a paper pulp company with nearly 30,000 acres. Yes, economics go in, uh, economics go in moving the work forward always. Yeah. I think that's real important. You know, we, we did make an attempt to look at that uh, in the economics, because, you know, you have that, you also have that lot of heavy equipment that and it needs to be moving all the time. So, so you need a land base to make that, make that possible. But you know the other side of that is there's a lot of this type. We the land we worked on, there's still a lot of this land up around, um, and there's still a lot of biosolids bio produced in this area that are trucked elsewhere. Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, we have one more uh, that uh, talks about the the harvesting question. How much effort and cost is associated with harvesting poplars? Is there a significant amount of labor involved. So I, I think originally they basically the trees were small because they planted so many of them and they just mulched them up and spread them across the site. Uh, but then as part of the permit, the, the thing is that the trees had to be removed from the site, I guess, because it you know, enter into nutrient dynamics. So when we were using a 10 by 10 spacing, uh, the trees were large enough, but really they were just they just had an automatic harvester coming through and they were just um, chipping them up and selling them as mulch uh, pretty much on a, 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 you know, a uh, you know, an even basis. Uh, but even that was good because prior to that, they were actually paying to have the trees harvested uh, when they were a much smaller size. So at least in this case, at least this was the site we were working, uh, there was someone taking the trees off site and mulching for mulching purposes so it wasn't it wasn't costing them anything. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a cost. And again, that an economic analysis that we did assumed that it was a cost. So there would be a safe, you know, as that enters into the enterprise. But and again, if you look at that publication, uh, you know, it has the enterprise budget and it separates out a lot of the costs and things like that. There's a lot of detail in there. The amount of effort involved in the harvesting is surprisingly oh. low. There's not a lot of people there. Um, there's an operator and then there's some other person there and I don't figure out, I never figured out what that other person was doing. But that's only a two person crew to do the cutting. Uh, they had a um, tub grinder they brought in to grind up some of it. And again, it was the same operator and someone else standing around, I guess probably operating the tub grinder. It was just two people and a bunch of equipment. Okay, one other question. Can you comment on the monitoring requirements by Ohio EPA associated with the Ohio mulch project in Ohio? Uh, not, not really. I just, I just know that the, I really don't know. I know there's, they're, they're, they're all I know is they're looking at it and deciding. How I'm not yeah, I'm not sure there are requirements yet. They're trying to form them because we have been asked to give our opinions on some various types of requirements. Um, so they may not have set their requirements in stone yet. But they, they do want to know about how much nitrogen is leaving. I will I know I do know that. So I think it'd be 
worthwhile to make sure attend the third seminar when Gary really uh, gets into that and, and the whole monitoring issue from his expert. As someone that's worked on a, a whole range of uh, coal spoils from Kentucky to Maryland, to Pennsylvania, wherever. <laughs> West Virginia? <laughs> no, that's just where my family home is and we know a few coal, coal truckers there anyway. Okay, that is the last question in the queue. So Jonathan, if you'll go ahead and stop sharing your screen, I've got one more thing to talk about before we let everybody go. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder that the series will continue next Wednesday, uh, same time, 2 to 3.30 p.m. thereabouts, Wednesday, October 20th. It's part two nuts and bolts of the DRE technique, the importance of getting it done right. So we've got a little bit of time left. We've got uh, time to give you, uh, go get some more coffee and take some extra time. We'll uh, let everybody go. So on behalf of Jonathan and Gary and myself, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and we look forward to the continuation of the series next week and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>